All right, let's get started. I would love to introduce my colleague and friend, Jose Pacas. He is a research scientist here at the Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation. He will be talking about how to give a research talk in 12 minutes. And ironically, he will have about 45 minutes to give that talk, which will be uh, full of interaction. Right, Jose? Yeah, let's hope right. so. All right, I'll turn it over to you. Thanks uh, everyone for being here. And Jose, I see you've started your screen sharing, so take it away. Thank you. Great. Well, thank you for having me. I am right now trying to find as many video faces that I can see. Right, so I'm Jose Pathis. Thanks for having me today. Um, it's really fun to do this via Zoom. I'm not used to this many people. So normally I would go around the room and ask for everyone to tell me what departments are in and when the next presentation is going to be, but 30 people is a little too much. So I'm just going to hopefully have some, I'll throw out questions sometimes and hopefully someone will be willing to answer. And I know I can call him Margaret at any time. So that's great. So I'm Jose Pacas. I'm uh, a research scientist. I work on IPUMS projects. I'm currently on IPUMS International, but I worked on IPUMS CPS and USA. That's a switch that I made in January. Um, and I'm an economist by training, and I say that out loud and out front so that you all know that that's my background. But a lot of the things that I'm going to talk about today, uh, they're not really discipline focused. I'm not going to talk about like the econ seminar style or anything like that. I am a firm believer that good presentations are a universal type of thing, and that that's something that we could all learn regardless of our discipline. Uh, so, can you all see? the slide, the beautiful slide with people in the background paying yes. attentive attention. So before I get started, I really want to promote this one book, The Better Presentations uh, by Jonathan Schwabisch. He's out of the Urban Institute, and I've cribbed a good amount of stuff from the book. Um, there's also a worksheet that I'm hoping that I'll be able to pass around to people um, that you can see in terms of crafting the presentation. And I'll try to figure out how to send that to you all, maybe on the, I'm not sure, maybe the Zoom link could work, but we'll try. Uh, so take a look at that book. It's amazing. And uh, a lot of the stuff you'll see is from there, but other resources that hopefully the slides will be shared later as well. Um, these are resources that I think are really great for finding a lot of stuff about presentations. Um, a couple of these people are at the University of Minnesota, um, but once again, I'll plug John Schwab. She also just came out with a brand new book on visualization of data that is really amazing. So take a look. So this is a part that I was going to ask everyone to talk about, but since we can't go around, um, no, too many people. So we're going to skip that part, but I think maybe by a raise of hand. Can I know how many people are technically in CLA, if there are departments in CLA? Do we have any economists in the room? Uh, there we go. All right, a couple. Great. Okay. Um, fantastic. And a few of you are applied econ, right? So, all right. Sadly, too big of a group. I really want to do more interactions, but... We'll keep going. So here's my soapbox moment, right? Giving good presentations is a skill. It requires work. Uh, I think this is something that's really glossed over in grad school in particular, right? We take how many papers do we write every year on topics that we probably will never look back. If you think back to fifth grade, we're writing essays on Neil Armstrong and whatnot, what, what, to what point it's to practice writing well. And that's how I want you all to be thinking about presentations is that it's a skill and it requires work and it's something that you really need to invest in that you're going to spend the rest of your career if you're going through the academia um, realm into the academia path making doing research but what good is that research going to be if you're not good at communicating that research and not just in the written form it's getting out there and really being an advocate for your research so this is an investment that will really pay off in the long run for you all. The other thing I like to tell people is that being extroverted 
is not a prerequisite for being an engaging speaker. I think people sometimes brush off the idea that like, oh, it's just not my thing. Some people are just naturally good at presenting. I can tell you for sure that I am not naturally good at writing, but I still have to do it and I practice it and you get better. So it's just something that you really have to be intentional about. And the last thing I like to tell people before we start is to respect your audience. Like all of you showed up today to listen to me. And if you show up and I have nothing prepared and I haven't thought about what I'm going to talk about, it's kind of a waste of your time. So when people show up to a presentation, even if they might have shown up to get some of that free food, they're still there listening to what you have to say. So respect that. And with that, we start, this, this is supposed to be about giving a 12 minute presentation. I won't even get into the presentation part for 12 minutes. So hold on. Why give conference presentations? There's a few reasons that this is not exhaustive, but one, it's to bring your research to life, right? We go to PAA, we've done all this research, and finally we got to talk about it. It's just part of that research process. You also get feedback in a very direct way. If you sit through any of the NPC seminars, you see immediately um, great feedback coming to the presenter. Whether they like it or not, it's going to be there. And so it's just great to get people's attention also. Because asking someone to review a paper is a lot bigger ask than just sitting through a presentation. The networking aspect, the lingering effect. This is a huge thing, especially at conferences, especially, which ties to the second part, if, if we're younger, right, we're starting out, you get a PAA, you might get the author of that paper that you just quoted in your literature review, they might be sitting in the audience and they might be like, well, I never knew Jose Pacas. I never heard of that person, but he's young. He does work in my field. At some point, it does build up your network. So this is another reason why you really want to focus on this. And so now jumping into the idea of like, how do we actually build presentations? I want to see how many people have, and by a show of hands, maybe done this sort of thing. You've written the paper, term paper, or an article for publication. And then you got asked to do a presentation. And then you cut and paste your, paste your abstract. You turned it into bullets. Maybe you cut and paste a few tables and figures. And then you just straight up presented that. Has anyone been guilty of doing that before? By a show of hands, I see a few people starting to do that, right? It's not great. We can do a lot better. So this is back to the soapbox and I'll get off this point again we can do a lot better at doing presentations than that. So we're gonna figure out how to avoid that. And right, keep in mind, this is very different than writing. I could technically give a presentation on other people's work and do a better job than the presenter themselves. Um, I'd love to use an example of a professor in the Applied Econ who does presentations based off of Microsoft Word. It's not even like PowerPoint, it's just straight up Word and it's almost verbatim. And I know the Applied Econ students have known, have seen this, but that professor, and this is what I really wanna say, is top of their field. And maybe it's okay for them to do that. I promise most of us here in this room, but we have some you know, tenured professors with, with us right now. Most of us outside of that group are not that good yet, right? We are not at the level where we can sort of phone in presentations. So we're gonna work on it. So how do we start? Uh, we're going to start with designing your presentation. And this is already starting to get into the 12 minute idea, right? It's an idea of simplicity. It's like less is more with presentations, especially when it comes to 12 minutes. In a 12 minute presentation, you probably can only tell one main point. You want one overriding theme, one point to really be given. You, it really benefits you to tell a story. And this is weird. It's not like, let me tell you about Little Red Riding Hood. It's more, well, here's the problem that we have. And basically make a story out of the research process and results that you've built in. And then contextualize your main point. And I think this is one of the, the most important parts. It's having consistent, well-planned visuals. Because that really keeps your audience engaged. If you've gone, I think, in, well, two years ago when we actually had seminar series in person, some of the best presentations were always the ones that had good graphs, good visuals, a lot less font. So the presentation worksheet, and I'm going to send this 
if you, I don't know if Lindsay's able to share something. Um, we're going to share this worksheet afterwards. But basically, John Schwabish suggests that before you get writing, before you start working on your presentation, you answer the following 10 questions. The first is what type of presentation you're, you're giving, right? Because it really matters. If I'm giving a presentation in applied econ, there are certain conventions and things that I know I have to do to fit that. But if I'm giving the presentation to policymakers, it's going to look very different. So start out by identifying who you're going to present to. Then focus on who your audience is. Is this like, are these people who really understand your higher level econometrics and models and theory? Or is it someone that really just needs to know, you know, smoking is bad for your health, right? Is that the level that we're talking about? So you identify these people, you identify the headline of your message. And if we were in the workshop part, by the way, this part would be taking us like, we'd each be writing this out for our own projects. Um, but we don't do that. So if you are, if you do have a presentation in mind that's coming up, this is the sort of thing that you should be thinking about. What's the headline of your message? Go into the part with, okay, so an audience walks out. What do you want them to do with your conclusions? Right? Some people, you know, in the, in the situation of tobacco is bad, smoking is bad for your health, right? Well, what do you want us to do with that information? Well, maybe stop smoking. Now, our research may be very different. It may be much more nuanced, but there's got to be a takeaway for your audience members. Really, 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 the next step is crafting your opening statement. This is the hook for the entire presentation. If you can't grab people at the beginning, they're going to be lost for the rest of the presentation. And this also will let you anchor the rest of your presentation back to the main point. It's like, remember when we were talking at the very beginning, this is about how tobacco is not good for your health. And you can always anchor back to that. Your closing statement, that's back to what do you want your audience to do with that? But this is also right, keep in mind of how you're going to be building your presentation. So you're bookending the, the presentation. Obviously, outline your sections. And if we really need one takeaway for the 12 minute part, and you're like, Jose, I really just wanted that 12 minute formula for how I should build this. This is one of the ways you can do it. And then we'll talk about why I would deviate from this. You can start out with a research question, right? You're crafting your opening statement. You're previewing your takeaway really quick. You've got a quick little lit review, maybe some theory framework, method and context takes up a majority of your time your results, and then finally the takeaway again. This is the simple way to think about a 12-minute presentation. Now, why I don't like to focus too much on this one way of doing it is because I think it's one, 12 minutes is so fast that you can already see that if you outline your presentation, 12 minutes is basically like saying, I found one thing, this is how I did it, end of story, right? Now, I think thinking about giving good presentations at a larger scale and a longer time scale for like 30, 40 minutes, like this presentation today, requires a little more investment and in how am I gonna occupy all that time? Cutting down to 12 minutes though, is an art because you really have to get rid of all the superfluous information, which is why when you get the worksheet, you'll see that it's really good to outline exactly what your points are gonna be so that you don't flounder. But this will be a slide that you all can look at and see if you wanna craft it around this. Um, it works pretty well, and we'll talk more about how you can get good at doing a 12-minute presentation. Uh, it's great to know what stories you can tell, right? Sometimes people, especially in academia, if we stay too much in the science of stuff, we can lose people. And even in an academic setting, I think some of the best presentations are ones where you can actually have this personal connection to the research and uh, keep people engaged. So as you develop your presentation, think about the type of stories that can be built in to your presentation. Images, and this I have in parentheses, describe before searching. Um, so you all remember the title slide that I had? I had an audience looking. Uh, there's an art to finding good images that will work well on PowerPoint. John Schwabish talks about it in his book, um, and I can show you some of the tricks later on. 
But the way you find it is that you actually have to write out in words what you're going to Google, basically. So I really wanted attentive audience, high quality resolution. So write out in words the sort of thing that you want to have, right? So I don't know what sort of pictures you'd want for tobacco is bad. I wouldn't maybe have Joe Camel in there because he's cool and that's not what you want, but you might want something more. No. You'd have to think about exactly what you're looking for. And finally, and I think honestly, this is more important, most important part, and economists might dread this part, is anticipate questions and answers. You already know the holes of your research. You can anticipate what questions are going to come up. So you just have a good set of Q and A's written down in your head that helps you figure out. And also, if you're a nervous presenter, this will do a lot to ease your nerves or calm the nerves before going in, because you can almost expect that you won't get questions that are impossible to answer. If you happen to be presenting at an econ seminar that has the worst type of um, audience members, uh, I don't know, hold on for dear life. <laughs> so most importantly, it's for me, it's about finding a process that works for you. So I'm gonna hold up the worksheet. Can you all see? This is what the worksheet looks like, right? So this part right now, if we were in the workshop, we would be filling this out, we'd have more time and you'd be building up your own presentation. The whole point about this part is that before you start with any presentation, you fill out this worksheet because it's gonna go a long way for you building up your presentation. Um, Jose, I'm, I'm happy to post that worksheet uh, under the events webpage for MPCs. Afterwards, okay. you send it to me. Perfect. I will. With all credit due to John Schwabish, I want to point that out. We do a lot of workshops with John Schwabish, so I don't think he's going to feel bad that we're just promoting his book and his stuff, but it's just really great stuff. So to me, presentations, it's really hard to give, like, this is the one way to do presentations because you have to find a process that works for you. So right now, my presentation I don't like having note cards. I don't like having notes written out. I don't like have things. I don't like reading off something. To me, what works is practicing beforehand and having an idea of what I'm going to say. But if you find that note cards are the thing that work for you, then go ahead and do that. Don't stop doing what, you, what works for you. You want post-it notes, write in the notebook. If you like using PowerPoint and having the notes underneath, do that. If you like, like drawing stuff out on a whiteboard, like if you're giving a class or something, if that's what you want to be doing, just know what works for you. So I don't know if there are questions so far, but right now, the thing that we're focused on, just to anchor back to what this section is about, it's designing your presentation. And what I'm trying to get you all to think about is before I actually start putting stuff on PowerPoint or whatever you're going to presentation mode you're going to use, Take a moment to think about what you need to do, what you want to talk about. Go through the presentation guideline, outline, figure that out, and then start building the presentation. Um, do we have questions so far? There's a lot more details coming up. Any reactions? I really appreciate seeing most of your faces. So it's especially the ones because I see Corey, he's got a mask on. He hasn't taken it off the entire presentation. So <laughs> It's, he's stone faced right now. I don't know if he's really into the talk or not, but. I have a question, um, but you probably are going to answer this. I'm just wondering how um, this is all different when doing a virtual presentation or what advice you have yeah. about doing a virtual one? Because I feel like yeah. um, I used to give talks and I thought it was something that I was decent at. And then when I tried to do a virtual one, especially where you have to record it, it was all bad. Yeah, we. I will get to the last few slides are about presenting in the age of COVID. And I think some, if people were at my last presentation, they talked about that. Um, I have a lot of thoughts. I'm not great on Zoom, I don't think, so far. I don't know how it's going. But yeah, it's a very different thing. And I think the hardest part is creating that connection that like, how do you get energy with the audience? An audience this big, I find much harder than if we were 10 to 12 people, where we could just, I could kind of call on people. Um, but at this, and at this size, oh, I hate card. Um, this size is a little tougher. All right. Shall we go into the, okay. yeah, please. Jump please. In. Yeah. I like this slide right here. And I'm just wondering, like, 
how you figure out what works for you. You know, if I'm like a first year, second year grad student presenting at PAA this year, I might not know, but it seems kind of hard, high stakes to like mess it up. So I can imagine yeah. saying like, oh, just try it and then try a different thing the next time. And it feels like high stakes to do that in real yeah. life. I mean, I guess maybe just practice, 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 but do you have uh, any advice about that? Yeah. I mean, my thoughts are I, so when I started doing presentations at PAA, I think I tried to adapt the uh, a much more rigid approach that didn't fit me. Like I wanted everything written out and I worked off a script and I tried to memorize and it just didn't feel natural to me. And so the only thought I have on that is that you kind of already know, at least let's say in grad school, undergrad, maybe you're still trying to figure things out, but you know you're your work style in general, right? Like if you're a person that takes notes on the computer in class versus on paper, then kind of adapt that strategy to building your presentation instead of trying to be like, well, now I'm going to start everything on computer because it's PowerPoint and I'd rather start there. But if you're a person that was like, I like writing things out first, then just do that. And so what I'm really pushing for is this idea that uh, giving a presentation is no different in terms of like how you have to adapt yourself, that it's like, just like writing, what's that process you like to use there? And then build build that into the presentation with the outcome being slightly different, like a nice, concise presentation. That's the only thought I have. Uh, and by no means am I like, honestly, an expert on all of this stuff. I think I have just tried to synthesize a lot of the stuff I've seen out there. Um, all right, I'm going to jump into the next slide, which is building your presentation, is this is really cool. You see, notice that cool little, what is that? I think that's an architect, architecture plans back there. Get it? Building your presentation. If you like this sort of layout, by the way, I can also show you John Schwabish showed us how to do this sort of thing. I think it's a nice, clean, cool way of doing slides. So this slide is busy on purpose. Right? I put this slide up, or you put this slide up at, at a presentation, no one's going to pay attention to you, right? This is the, let's just put Microsoft Word up there and walk away. People can just read that. You don't want that. A presentation in many, many ways is almost, it's really about the research and the point that you're trying to give, but another part of it is focusing on you, right? Like that person is a knowledgeable person of that research and their research is original, but also especially if you're working with co-authors, I think presentations are a moment where you really have to prove your expertise. Because if you don't really get your stuff, then you're kind of going to lose people and say, well, that person's not really the most knowledgeable. All the questions went to the other co-author afterwards. And so this is why I'm trying to say like, this really is about you and trying to make sure that you are the person that's coming out as the expert on the topic. How this relates to the slide is that if people are focusing on the words, they're not focusing on you. So you don't want this. You want something like this. You don't want to make them choose. You want them to say, I got to pay attention to Jose because otherwise I don't know what this talks about and that's it. So how do we do that? White space or simplicity, less is more, right? If I put that point on the screen and I say, all right, everyone focus on something. You're all looking at the, I don't know the color of that dot. <laughs> red, I think. So colorblindness is another situation that we'll get into. I'm colorblind and we'll talk about colorblind tools. And I realized that I think that's red. So someone please just say, yes, it's red. <laughs> okay. Thank you. Now you all focus on that dot, right? That's a, it, it's intentional, right? We are trying to focus people's attention through putting less things on the screen. Uh, we want to have, we don't want to distract people with like, we want to use consistent fonts, we want things to look uniform. So if you have four dots and they were all four different colors, then you'd be like, what's going on with the colors? And if your point isn't the fact that they're four different colors then you lose people. But you can also use animations and annotations to guide people's um, attention. So we're gonna be walking through each of these more in depth to really highlight the sort of things that you can do, right? This is what we talked about. What are you all looking at? The white dot, and I know that that's white. And if it's not white, I'm, I'm, I'll be really sad. So how do we do this, right? In PowerPoint, 
I, I don't know how many of us, we have a lot of templates in PowerPoint. Um, and sometimes we may not be able to get away from the templates that our university makes us use, right? So like for giving a presentation and Minnesota Population Center wants the, the little stamp there, you might be stuck with that. But I would suggest that that's something you all can do on the title slide. And then for the rest of the presentation, it's going to be a game of cutting everything out. So choosing a font, right? We talk a lot about, well, this is actually, we're not actually, don't focus on choosing the font. We'll get to choosing a font. This is a slide about choosing a font and how we're going to make it better, right? So we've got all this stuff happening on this slide, but we can start cutting out the, the you notice the, the white space, that little box, cut that out. It's getting a lot simpler. Why do we have a pen back there? Well, because it's about writing and we thought we'd make a cool point and, you know, it's cute. You might as well just use uh, the clip art that we used to have. So let's cut everything extraneous from that slide. At this point, we're really focusing on the context, right? This slide is a lot easier to follow or to focus on than this. Would we agree? So as simple as it may be, I think a lot of the times we just take templates and go with it. And what we're proposing here is it's okay to clear out the templates. It's okay to have a lot cleaner of a slide. Doesn't mean it has to be black and white, but you can get it a lot cleaner. We don't want this crazy font on the right. That stuff is distracting, hard to see. We just want the plain text font. All right. So let's go through one more example of how a slide that's super, super busy can be cleaned up to be something that's much better. So this slide is about people smuggling and human trafficking. I think this is an example from Deborah Levison or from the people at IONE, which is partly why I've told Lindsay, please don't post these slides because I haven't fully attributed the work to everybody that it should be. But you all should know that I'm trying to attribute the work to those people. So we start with this busy slide, people smuggling, human trafficking. Is people smuggling the same as human trafficking? All right, let's strip the theme. We go from here to here, right? Things, the same content, just things are a little cleaner. Now we identify one main point per slide, right? Because there's a lot of stuff we wanna say here. There's, let's, let's count them. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten 10 points on this one slide. So imagine giving the presentation, getting to the slide and being here for 20 minutes because you can't get off of this slide. Well, let's identify one main point per slide, right? So human smuggling and trafficking have some similarities, but are not the same thing. This idea of thinking graphically, not textually, right? Instead of saying all those points, right? We have 10 points there. Well, actually they're all unified by one idea, and we can actually show the entire point of that one slide in the graph. Label and cite your graphics, that's a little nudge to me as well. But you can see here, right, that it's a lot easier to visually see that the Venn diagram is trying to talk about smuggling and trafficking than it is to not have those in there, right? We'd have to clearly be telling people, the one on the left is smuggling and the other one on the right is trafficking. You don't want that. Uh, and that's basically in one slide or in one example, how you strip themes out of, um, how you simplify your slides to get your one single point across, right? We went from this slide all the way here. This allows your, your audience member to really focus on what you're gonna say and really take away the point, right? We can see that there's some similarities between smuggling and trafficking. I know nothing about these two, but you've shown in the Venn diagram a very visual way, easy visual way to see what the point is that you're trying to make. So that's work that you're going to have to do as you construct your slides. Uh, what I wanted to point out with this one is when we talk about this title slide, what do you all like about it and what don't you like about it? Any volunteers? Is there something that you, no, let me get started with what you do like. I see Mark coming in. Mark, help me out here. 
I've just kind of been adjusting back and forth, but you caught me. So um, I, I like that the title is really descriptive and is short. Um, and that its placement on this slide is the first thing that I notice. Thank you. Yeah, there's there's not a lot going on on this slide, right? But I would I would like to adventure that this present this title slide is a much cleaner slide that lets you all at least get a little bit engaged into what we're going to be talking about than if I had a very long presentation, a title presentation, a whole lot of stuff. Jose Pacas, Institute for Social Research and Data Innovation, University of Minnesota, research scientist, February 26, 2021. And like there's a place for that. And I understand that sometimes we need to turn the slides in. But if people walk into your room and this is all they see, I don't think they're going to miss out on all that information. So what I'm pushing is simplicity. So we're going to talk real quick about animations. And this is really a slide that I made. I was talking about Neil Armstrong. Um, animations are great. I think they have a place, but there's a way to go overboard. For example, yeah, that's Neil Armstrong. I don't know if you all did this when you were, but then you, you had this situation. All right, I'll stop. You get the point. Animations can be really annoying. And I don't think I've ever seen someone <laughs> during my grad school experience give a presentation that had animations like that. I think I have seen the little swoop thing happen, um, which isn't great. Um, you clearly don't want to do that, and none of you would. Um, only I would want to do this situation. So but animations can do so much. And we'll get into using PowerPoint and PDFs to preview that. PowerPoint is really dangerous in the time in the age of COVID and Zoom because you don't know what the animations are gonna do, but PDFs can serve the same exact function um, if you just have like differences across two slides. So, right, I want all of you to focus on that one dot. My next point is the second dot and my last point is that right dot. That helps the audience member just go with you. You can also control the sort of information that you're unveiling so people aren't reading before. You can control that with animations and I'll show you an example of that as well. Annotating is great. And this is, I'll show you an example, but one of my biggest pet peeves is when we just copy paste the table, especially the big tables with all the regression results and you're only going to talk about one thing out of that whole slide. And then you say, really sorry that this is really small and probably you can't read it. At that point, you know that you've just, you, you didn't even care. You just be like, I don't have time to clean this up because you know it's small. And you can at least do, if you're going to do that, you can at least help us figure out what number you're talking about. This little square on, on PowerPoint is just a shape that you drag and you put. And if you animate it, say, I want you all to focus on that one circle. There you go. But now I want you to look at this other circle. You can use an arrow. It's really easy to use animation to guide people through your slide. Or we can do a little fill in. So we we're talking about the example of human smuggling and trafficking, right? We have a lot of points here. I could hang out on this slide and talk about smuggling. Then I could say, we also got trafficking on this side. And where they overlap is this middle part, right? You all can hang out here and talk, talk here, show them there. You are not letting your audience member get ahead of your point. You want them to stick with you the whole time and animations can help you with that. The point I'm making with the PDFs instead of animations, and this is like twofold. In PowerPoint with an animated slide, you actually don't know from looking at it, what's gonna be on the screen until you run the slide, right? I don't know what's coming next. These are not three slides, that's one. So it's really hard for you to see that as you're looking through your PowerPoint and walking through what's gonna happen within each individual slide. Instead, what I'm offering to you is don't do animation, make a copy of this one slide. The next slide looks like this. So you're just going from one slide to the next, and that would be your third slide. 
And what that actually ends up doing is um, it's a lot easier for PDF to handle it as well, right? Because then you can just print everything out. And as you scroll through your presentation, you are basically animating through PDF. That's my point with animations. Dangerous in PowerPoint. And I've had it where my connection's been slow and my PowerPoint animations just haven't worked and it's terrible. So any questions so far? That, that's probably one of the more practical things that I'm gonna give in this presentation. Any questions? All right, let's keep on going after uh, bad examples, right? This is not the worst, most egregious. What is the point of this slide? We're trying to figure out who uses tobacco products the most. By looking at this slide, can you tell? There's a little bit of bolding going on somewhere. It's really hard to tell. But what if we change this slide to a graph? Right? And this is actually like the lift sometimes that I think holds us back from doing that is that our table has um, our, our present, our paper doesn't have a graph in it, it's just a table. And so you sit there being like, oh, I don't want to make a table, a graph for this presentation. Sometimes your presentation will have figures that don't exist in your paper because it just makes it a lot easier to understand. That's what I mean about putting in that extra effort. Sometimes that presentation alone needs to be better looking than what the paper looks like, right? So here you can clearly see the prevalence of tobacco products amongst American Indians and Latinos. That is the whole point. I could point to that. Now, this slide is the sort of thing that I'm talking about, regression results. We are only focused on four things off this slide. If we're not gonna talk about the control variables, why do we put them up there? I would say that sometimes people are like, well, notice all the significance or the lack of significance is what I want you to see. That to me is still like, well, you can make that point without putting everything up there. Uh, instead, this is a much easier slide. We took out the household characteristics and we just left the coefficients that we we're really interested in. And as we talk about things, you can highlight now I want to talk about these coefficients here. So just to go through that one more time, this is a slide that you could offer. This is what you should end up with. It's a lot cleaner, a lot easier. You point people to your paper if you want them to look at your tables. That's what it's there for. And notice animation working here. Focus on these, look at these. This is the example that I want you to look at. Now, this is a much bigger example, a much like we have this pie chart to start with. Here's what we could actually end up doing with it. Pie chart turns into a bar chart, right? It's a lot, we can see that Denmark was hard, the 39% was really hard to tie up. I think the, the colors are throwing me off big time. But then you can see which ones in this case I wanted people to focus on, right? I have the USA and Denmark. That's what I want, to pe want people to focus on. Well, I can also label it, right? Because I want people to know how much more prevalent, um, how many more kilometers people are cycling a day. And then I can also make the title much more informative than what it is, right? The point is that Dane cycle 16 times further than Americans each day. And the final slide looks like this, right? So if we compare this, to this, this slide is basically like as simple as it can get, gets to the point, nicely labeled and graphically, we could sit here comfortably looking at this chart without having our eyes straight. All right, so this is about stripping out a lot of needless information. You all feeling good right now? These are, that's the last. Mm -hmm. Can I jump in with a question, please? Yes. I know you were talking about um, being prepared for the Q and A. That more complicated slide, a few slides back, would that one be good to have uh, prepped in, the, in case a question comes up about control variables? So you could throw it up if someone particularly asked about- A hundred percent. Go yeah. back, go back another one. Yeah, that, that, this one. That more complicated uh, sorry. one, yeah. Right here, absolutely. Right. Uh, that's typically what I recommend to people is like, if you know that question's gonna come, that someone's gonna wanna come up to you after the, the talk or during the talk, there are ways to link to other slides, right? To say like, oh yes, I anticipated that. 
And here's a little link down at the bottom right that says, you know, control variables or full results. That is a much better way. And in fact, is a great way to show people that you, you know that you, you did this on purpose. You didn't forget the covariates. They're there, but that's not your point. So I think that's a great point, Lindsay. Thank you. All right. If we could have presentations that look like that, I think that'd be great. We can strive for that sort of thing. The color scheme is your own choice, but I think this is a great example. Okay. So what point, like what size of font do you all think we should be using for our presentations? Like 16. Any? 16. Okay. 24, big enough for old people to see. All right. That was Rob, right? And by old people, I mean me. Yes. Yeah, I was going to say, take a look. All right. So here's 14. This is, this is 18. That's 28. Right? In fact, I would say if you can shoot for 28 and up, you're great. If you can get 36, that's as high as you really want to go. But 36, 28 is good. The one takeaway in this space in testing font is that you also need to understand what space you're going to be presenting in. So assume, well, let's assume you're not going to be giving an auditorium full, but maybe you are. And you want people to be able to read it from anywhere in a big room. You should practice, you should get it on the screen and you should walk back and take a look at what the font size looks like for that person in the back, right? This is part of respecting the audience, right? If you're gonna know, if you're gonna give a presentation, you want everyone to enjoy it and font size is important, which gets to another point that I don't have written down, uh, which is um, I don't have a rule of thumb for how many slides you should give per minute, right? I think sometimes people say one minute per slide or something like that. I actually think that it should be as many slides as you need to make that point. And sometimes one slide can be very simple and it'll take you 20 seconds to do, but then it builds onto the next slide and the next slide and you need three slides per minute, but it does a much better job of explaining and getting through the point you're trying to make. So I am not someone that's gonna tell you a 12 minute presentation is a 12 minute slide. Maybe it's a 20 slide, but you have a lot less on that slide. If the font size is like 36 or 48, how many points can you actually get on that slide anyway? So that's just one thing that I'm very adamant about is there's no rule. It's what you need to build to make the point in those 12 minutes which may correlate to about one slide per minute, but I'm not saying that, it always does. The sort of font is important. And what John Schwabish suggests is a sans serif, right? It's basically these blocky type of fonts that don't have little curls to them. And the other advantage to these is that the bolding of these fonts is very visible, right? That you can tell that that's bolded relative to when it's not. Simpler fonts, I think, are the way to go. I don't think people need to think about, well, it's going to make it boring. Like they're, everything else you're doing in your presentation is going to make your presentation interesting. It's not the font that's going to drive this. So simpler fonts is what we're pushing for. Any, I typically use Calibri. I think the MPC uses a font that is harder to get. I don't remember what it is, but these fonts are available and mainly free. That's kind of the advantage of them. One of the things, and color is a big issue for me, and I think I have a slide here that will talk about color blindness. Um, three colors can really help you sort of go through. Your text can be one color. You could have this pop color to really highlight certain things. And then you can have this third color for secondary emphasis, right? You can do a lot with color, but you gotta be very careful about it, but don't exceed three colors. Right, this is a contrast. So I can't see that. I put a link down here to the colorblind friendly palette. This is something that is extremely useful. I can barely tell the difference between the middle square and the left square, 
Um, I've had moments where people will show me graphs or maps that are heat maps that are based on the green and red scale. And to me, basically, there's no difference happening in that graph, right? Red and green is really tough for people. And if the point is to really highlight and point people's eyes to certain things, you got to take more time thinking about how you're going to make sure that everyone can see that color. Yeah, I don't. Does anyone, can someone please tell me what colors <laughs> we're looking it's at? It's like a medium blue and then a, like a dark denim blue and then a burgundy red. Okay. Yeah, those are the worst colors. So don't do that. <laughs> All right. Any questions on constructing? I'm throwing a lot at, your, at you, um, mainly because I'm trying to get a lot into like, how would you actually like the useful parts of building your slide deck? Because um, I think it's important. Any questions here? And I'm going to give you all the resources that I can afterwards via email. But any questions on building slides? Simpler is better. Oh, all right. It's too simple, bad. Like if you just use the default PowerPoint black and white option. I I think there's. I don't think it's a terrible thing, but I think there's easy ways to make it a little more pleasant. So like the color scheme that I use here is the Ipum's blue and white, which is kind of a trendy thing, I think, right now to have this dark background with white font. Um, but honestly, I don't think there's anything too simple. It just means that like the presentations, like I had to listen to that person and the PowerPoint really substantiated the points they were making. I think you're, again, it's, you're going to be the one that's, really driving the presentation. The, the presentation can't be a, a crutch for you all. I'm like, well, it's on the slide, just read the slide, right? All right, giving your presentation. This is like, you've got 12 minutes or you got 45 minutes to me, it doesn't. What changes here is how much interaction you can have, I think, between a 12 minute presentation and an hour. In an hour, we can have Q's and Q and A's. In a 12 minute presentation, like at PAA, for the most part, and the profs in the room can tell me about their experiences, but you get 12 minutes uninterrupted type of thing. That's not a lot of time. You get questions later on, right? So some of the stuff I'll give you here is if you're trying to do a presentation that's a little longer, but for a 12 minute, it's getting to the point and walking through that. The biggest advice, and maybe it's just at this point, how many times have you heard this is you got to practice your presentation, practice, practice, especially for a 12 minute presentation. The advantage of a 45 to an hour minute presentation is that I can sort of meander for a second, come back to the point without losing everybody in a 12 minute. You've just wasted a 12th of your time, right? You need to really practice your presentation. So tools for prepping, not crutches. Right, uh, these are not crutches. You, you, it's okay to rely on these. If you need to write a script and you need to figure out everything that you're gonna say, then just do that. Own that from the beginning and be like, I'm gonna work off this script. This is gonna be my insert joke here situation. If that's what you need, then it's okay. If you're gonna do note cards, do that. If you're gonna do the smartphone, I think that one's a little trickier, right? Because you look like you're staring at your phone, but if you're able to place it down on the podium in a way that no one really notices, that's fine. I've seen plenty of people do that with a smartphone or even start walking around with it, but it does look a little weird. Um, the notes on the PowerPoint, I do think require a little extra work, right? So if you're gonna, you need to practice, get, do you all know what I'm talking about with the notes at the bottom of the PowerPoint? And when you click presentation mode, you have to click into presenter mode. But if you're going to PAA and you don't have time to practice doing that and make sure it's going to go nicely on the screen, right? We may, you may not, you may run out of time. And I've seen people not have access to their notes because they couldn't figure out in time what to do. So that's kind of a tricky space. Putting all your notes at the bottom of the PowerPoint makes you, uh, puts you, oh, it makes you amenable to bad situations. Another thing is do not read off the slide, right? If you're going to read off the slide, you that's not, not fun for anyone. It's not a teleprompter. 
It's just to help you get to your point. And if we're talking about public speaking, and I don't know, well, you guys can't see my posture here. I think I have good posture. At least I'm standing up right here because it's much easier for me to present. But you need to maintain good posture. 12 minute presentation at PAA, that's kind of where my brain's going. You need to look good. You need to look like you know what you're talking about. Posture can convey a lot of that. I'm not saying you have to smile all the time. There's something, it's more being like engaging in a way that doesn't seem very off putting, is really what I'm trying to get at. But if you're prone to smiling, it's okay to smile from time to time. The small natural gestures, I, this would be distracting if I was doing this all presentation and you guys would be just confused by that. But if they don't look natural, if they look very robotic, then that's not good either. You just want to be comfortable and natural in the space and maintain good eye contact is another thing that I really focus on. So this whole time I've been looking at every single one of you, at least the people with the videos and the people with the pictures have the best eye contact so far. But you know, it's what I mean by anchoring is find that one person in the room. You're going to find that where that they're attentive. This is when you really appreciate the nodders, right? The person that's looking at you being like, yes, yes. Like I'm going back to boost up my confidence to that person. I'm also trying to focus on people who aren't giving a lot of response. So Rob, you would be the person I focus on and be like, if I can't convince Rob that what I'm saying is good, then I don't think I've done a good job with my presentation. You find the person that you're like, they're attentive, but they're not convinced yet. To me, that's an important person in the room. And then you try to ignore the people who are on their phone and doing other stuff. But to me, anchoring is about finding the pe your comfort zones with people across the room. And I think last time I gave this talk in person, I completely neglected the right side of the room because I guess I didn't find someone over there. But still, anchoring is a good, good thing to practice. Learn your fillers. By this, I mean, do you do a lot of ums, ums? How many presentations have we been to where you hear the person say like, 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 and all you can hear is the 50th like in that one sentence. So you can learn that about yourself by recording yourself. It's the most painful process, which is why like they're recording this. I'm not going to go watch it myself because I hate listening to my voice. You don't want to hide. This might seem crazy that people might do this, but people might sit down behind the podium or kind of crouch behind and not really be seen. You're giving a presentation. You got to get out there. You don't want to be hiding behind stuff. You really like if the podium's at the right level, sure. But you just don't want to find a way to try to hide, basically. Volume and speed is really important, especially with the size of the room. If you don't have a microphone, then you have to practice amplifying your voice to the back of the room and slowing down. Especially in a 12 minute presentation, you don't want to be flying through that. So, back to the practice and cutting things out, volume and speed is going to be really important for people paying attention to you. I'm a firm believer on moving is okay. 12 minute presentation behind the podium, you may not be able to, but if you've got 45 minutes, I don't mind if people are walking from one side to the room to the other. I think it's a very engaging strategy, but I think moving like this is very distracting. Mm. So by moving, I mean, if you're okay to walk out into the audience, basically, not like through the aisles or anything, I'm just talking about the front from one side of the room to the other. I think that's great. Jose, sorry to jump in. We just have a couple of minutes oh, left. Yeah. So just we can, to give you a we quick can, time we can time. wrap up. We can talk. Let's get then in the age of COVID real quick. Cause there's a bunch of stuff. The stuff that I talk about presenting in the age of COVID is know your platform. If you, you're going to be on zoom, WebEx, Google hangouts, teams, whatever it is, if you are not comfortable with one of those and you know, you're giving a presentation, go practice because I've found that like controlling the screen might be very different. Um, picking parts of your screen to present might be different. That might be like, you don't get to present your PowerPoint notes. So you want to practice that platform. You want to test the technology as much as you can, um, right? Like I had the chats going here and I didn't realize it for a while. Something I should have remembered. People saying, dropping out, but saying something. Um, and looking good. I don't know. I wouldn't say that I look good. I would say that the, my environment looks good. You add me to the picture a little worse, 
but I think I'm at least at eye level, which is something that I had to raise. Like I'm, you are sitting on the microeconomic theories and constitutional law book so that you can see me eye to eye. Um, you want good lighting. I think the, the worst thing is when you have lighting that's coming from, I think, towards the screen, because then you go dark and that gets really hard for people to see. So you don't want that. You want to practice where you're going to give your presentation. There's a link up here um, that talks about everything you can do to sort of improve your looks on Zoom. I have the look much better than I do filter on, which is like, I don't know, it cleans up your presentation, touches you up or something. Use that. Uh, sharing a portion of your screen is another option. So I am only sharing the, the PowerPoint window, not the whole slide, not the whole um, desktop, just that window. That allows you to do a lot more with the other parts of your screen so that like right now I'm focused on you, but my PowerPoint's on the right. So I see what's happening there. I say, be cool if your tech isn't working. Like everyone in the age of Zoom knows that tech isn't gonna work well, you might sputter out. I think the worst is to freak out about it instead of saying, hey, I'm having technical difficulties one moment, let me regroup and come back. That's a much easier way. And have a backup plan. By that, I mean, you're gonna present in PowerPoint, that's not working. Well, you better have printed out the PDF version, saved it to your desktop so you can share that immediately with the person who's controlling uh, the PowerPoint and they can do that for you. So the backup plan is just thinking about what could go wrong here, who needs to have backups on my presentation. So I think the time is basically up, but really what, I'm, what I want people to take away from this is that you all have a choice when it comes to presentations. You can be boring, unprepared, sloppy. You can waste everyone's time for showing up. Hopefully that's not today. Or you can give an engaging, memorable, informative presentation that people really enjoy and that that's a choice you're all making and something that you have to work at. So I'll stop there. I know it's 1.15 and I think that's the end of it. Um, but thank you for your time. Hopefully some of the tips in here will be useful to you all. Yes, thank you so much, Jose. Wonderful, great information. And we will have this recording up on our website. Does anyone have a quick question uh, before we wrap today? Did I hear someone come on? I do have a question. Oh, sorry. Go ahead, Chris, we can hear you. Yeah, I'm sorry, I, technical problems. I cannot connect my camera right now. Uh, but uh, yeah, I was just wondering what Jose thinks about the LaTeX kind of uh, type of presentation because I think this is all PowerPoint. So I just yeah. want to know, because uh, mm. now like, I feel like some economists see you weird if you don't use LaTeX presentations and PowerPoint instead. So yeah. uh, or what would be your recommendation on those? Yeah. Um, one, let's not give in to the worst habits and practices of our field. LaTeX, Beamer in particular, is great and it's good to sort of build in your tables. Uh, but I think you can strip out a lot of the themes in LaTeX, you know, the how people like to have the outline at the top. They have the little bubbles and you can see kind of where you're going. It gets very, very heavy and cluttered. You can take all of that out. And why I don't really care about LaTeX is that like it's a font type that you're really focused on, which you can get in PowerPoint, something similar. Mm. And by the end of the day, if you strip out everything and for all intents and purposes, your PowerPoint and LaTeX will look very similar. So that my, my, my strong opinion is that it, the presentation is more important than the, the platform you're using, um, even as a signaling thing. It might be All for right. the equations that people don't like to use word for, for the typing equations. Yeah, the equations do get a little tougher sometimes on here, but I think it's still not bad. And if you really need to sort of like take a picture of something from somewhere else, that's one way to get around it. Whatever it's going to be, I would say that LaTeX, this whole presentation could have been LaTeX and it would have been fine. I would have done the same sort of stripping out of themes. Mm. So if you want to use LaTeX, it's fine. Just don't make it cluttered. Everything that I talked about applies to LaTeX as well. Um, thank you, Jose. I think we better end there to stick to our time, but thank you again for joining us today. 
And thank you all. And we will see you again next Friday. Have a great weekend. Thank Bye you, everyone. everyone. Thanks, Jose. Mm-hmm.